So, oh, Sean, do you want to come up? Good morning, everyone. This is Sean. Hello. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us, first of all, who you are and who you live with. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> so uh, my name's Sean. I live in uh, Bristol, uh, I, and I live with my wife, Gabby, and uh, we've got four children, and our cat is called Shadow. Uh, we've got our kids' ages go from 15 down to eight. So busy then, because you only yeah, have a small... Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> My wife was away this week, and then she came back, so I actually feels less busy now, you know, because it's all relative, isn't it? So, uh, yeah. And you only have a part-time job as well, isn't yes, it? So, yeah. Yes, so tell right. us about your job. job. Yeah, I'm <laughs> tell us about your easy job. I'm the principal of Trinity College, Bristol, so we train people to be vicars mainly, and we have people coming to study from, uh, you know, all kinds of different backgrounds and walks of life as well, so um, uh, I'm just mentioning that in case any of you would like to study a bit of theology. I mean, you could you can judge for yourself after you've heard me speak, I suppose, whether you'd like to, whether that's something you'd be Or you can in. ask me, because he was one of my teachers. Oh, yes, that's true. Yeah, of course <laughs> I was. Yeah, so when I was at Melitis training, Sean was uh, my ethics tutor. Yeah. One of them, yeah, ethics indeed. teachers. Yeah. So tell us before you preach, just to lighten the mood, what's your favourite way of chilling out? My favourite way of chilling out? Well, I don't know if it's my favourite, but... Just recently in Bristol, many of you will know if you've been to Bristol, the Bristol Downs, be the beautiful kind of green open space in Bristol. I mean, I know if you live in Bath, you probably don't need to come elsewhere for <laughs> lovely green spaces, do you? But we've got the Bristol Downs, and I've recently joined the military fitness exercise class that what? meets on, Bris on, on, on what Bristol is Downs. That? Well, it's like it's like be, you know, it's like it's former army military instructors. Uh, physical trainers do kind of exercise classes for civilians. So it is, I don't know if it's my favourite thing to do, but it's definitely having an impact <laughs> I, I'm not on me. sure that chilling and it out. Is very good. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are, start, I mean, at the weekends it's quite civilised, but in the week you, the classes start at six in the morning. So it's fine in the summer, but I don't, I don't know if I'll keep it up in the winter. I think, it, I think it's very impressive. I, it, is ve <laughs> it is very impressive, yeah. It's very yeah. impressive. Yeah, on that right. note, Thank I'm going to hand Brown. over Thanks to you. Thanks for having me, everyone. No worries. Okay. Over to right. you. Well, there's a little handout. So if you were given um, with your, you, when you came in with your notice sheet, if you haven't got one of those, maybe just pop your hand in the air and the lovely welcome team have got spares so they can, they can come around and just give you, the, give you the handout so you can see what I'm going to be talking ab about, he says. Checks the time. Oh, it's very dangerous having that chandelier <laughs> in between see. me and the clock. When I, I was preaching once at our church, we used to live in London, the church in London, and my wife thought I was going on a little bit, and so she started tapping her watch, and I didn't stop right away. So she then started pointing at the clock on the wall. So if you need to do that, I will completely understand, especially on Father's Day. Some of you will have lunch bookings, probably, won't you? So, um, but as, as Fran said, um, uh, that's my day job. I work in Bristol and it's lovely to be with you. I'll share a little bit about my story in a moment. But um, as Tim has said, you're going through this story, this season of looking at the Holy Spirit and the work of the Spirit in our lives. And so this morning we come to think about um, spiritual sexuality. And I'll share a little bit about my, my journey as how the Holy Spirit has worked in, in my life in, in the area of sexuality. But we can feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I don't know how many of you are feeling a little bit uncomfortable thinking, oh gosh, we're going to be talking about sex this morning. I wasn't expecting that, and you know, uh, this is. Are we allowed to talk about that sort of thing in in church? I don't know. And some of you, some of you feel very relaxed, but I just want to acknowledge for some people that might feel a little bit more uncomfortable because when it comes to sex and Christianity, we're often kind of trained to think of this as a bit of a no go area, um, and and there are, there is actually a good reason for that, or a bad reason for that, but there is a, 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 a then ex, an explanation for that. Um, there's there was a theologian called. St. Augustine. Put your hand up if you've heard of St. Augustine. Most of you will have heard of him uh, if you've been knocking around church for a little while. And uh, he was very influential from the fourth century of the church, very influential on Christian theology, but he had quite a big hang-up about sex. So uh, he, were, he, just to summarize his, one of his writings on sex, uh, or in fact on marriage, he said this, uh, it's better not to get married 
But if you do have to get married, then okay. You know, it's kind of a second best. So singleness is better. In fact, he said virginity is the best kind of way of life, not to have sex at all. Uh, but if you have to, if you can't control yourself, you know, it's okay to get married. And then he said, um, uh, but, but if you do get married, you should try not to have sex. You know, even within marriage, he regarded sex as something a bit negative, okay? And he said, but if you do have to have sex within marriage, why, why, why would that be allowed? Well, two reasons. Number one, to make babies. Obviously, you know about that. You know, number one, to make babies. And number two, um, you know, to prevent you from sleeping with somebody that you're not married to. So in order to avoid doing something worse, you might have sex within marriage. Um, and if you do, God will forgive you. Okay, so it's better to avoid sex, even within marriage. But he says, but if you do have sex within marriage, it is a ma- what he calls a matter of pardon. It's something that God needs to forgive you for. And so this is hardly the most ringing endorsement, is it? Uh, and Augustine, as I said, went on to have this very influential role within Christian theology. And so quite often, when it comes to thinking about sex uh, within the church, we're inheriting this quite negative view, this kind of quite sort of, this is something a little bit shameful, a little bit dirty, we maybe shouldn't talk about it. And I think actually we need to be much more um, kind of confident and comfortable talking about it uh, if we're going to engage with the world around us, which is generally much more comfortable thinking and and talking about sex. Uh, Let me explain why. Let me just give you a little illustration as to why this is. And I'm going to change this, if I can change the metaphor, change the subject, to talk about food, okay, which as you can see is a subject very dear to my heart. It's kind of written into the shape of my body that I like food, isn't it? That's why I have to go to this exercise class. And you know, let me just think about this. If I was to give you two ways of engaging with food, two ways of thinking about or, or kind of approaching food. Number one is what we might call the starvation diet. Okay, under the starvation diet, you're not allowed to talk about food, you're not allowed to think about food, and you're not allowed to eat any food. Okay, the starvation diet. Okay, the other option, I'm going to give you a second option, which is the junk food diet. Okay, under the junk food diet, you're allowed to eat as much as you like, but you're only allowed to eat junk food. Yeah, okay, some of you are, well, either you're just, not, some of you aren't switched on, or some of you don't like speaking out, but we'll, see, we'll just see, see how we go. Okay, so the starvation diet or the junk food diet. Now, if those are the only two options, can I just ask for a show of hands, how many takers we might have for the starvation diet? diet here this morning? <clears throat> Any takers for, for the starvation diet? I don't think there's anyone. No one's going for that one. And if those are the only two options, how many of you are going to opt for the junk food diet? Okay, uh, the majority of you. How many of you haven't put your hands up yet? Because you can tell it's a trick question and you don't like just being given two options. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Some of you are in that, in that category. Okay, the What's the problem with the starvation diet? You die. Yeah. Okay. What's the problem with the junk food diet? You die. You get fat and then you die. You die. But what a way to go. Yeah. No, because we know both of those approaches are unhealthy, aren't they? They are both damaging. And so you know, we, we, we shouldn't go for either of those approaches. We know when it comes to food that there is a third way. There is another way which is, help, you know, which is engaging with, which is enjoying food, but in the right kind of quantities. I'm definitely still talking about food, okay? Um, you know, we know that just, but, but the thing is, here's the thing. If we, if, if we just 
offer people, you're not allowed to talk about it, you're not allowed to think about it, and you're certainly not about, allowed to do it. If you change to think about back, back to sexuality now, if all we offer and all we think it is, is the starvation diet, you're not allowed to think about sex, you're not allowed to talk about sex, certainly not allowed to do it, or, you know, and August, Augustine, I'm looking at you here, you know, try not to enjoy it, you know, that kind of, if that is all we have to offer, most people will go for anything goes. You know, if you're just saying just repress it, ignore it, it's bad, it's dirty, then th people won't necessarily look at that there's a healthy option. They will think, well, I'm just going to go for it with anything then because I got this, there, there is this desire within me. God has made us as sexual beings. It's not, it's not a bad part of who we are but if we're told it's bad, we'll tend to go to the opposite kind of end of, end of the scale. So that's just a little bit of an intro uh, to kind of get us used to thinking about sex in church and to kind of that, to hopefully warm up to the idea that this is something that is okay and a healthy thing, an important thing uh, to, to talk about. Let, let me unpack a little bit about my sort of story and journey in the area of sexuality, if I may now. Um, my, um, I've got quite a distinct, distinct kind of experience, which is that when I was about 16, 17, I'd become a Christian and I started to realize I was gay. So for me, as, as Franz in the interview said, I'm married to a woman uh, now. But for me, uh, it was not a question of kind of a, a kind of a typical experience, but realizing when at the age when my friends were getting kind of interested in girls, I was starting to develop feelings for one or two of my friends and thinking, kind of, this is weird. This I don't seem to be experiencing the same things that they are experiencing. And at school in those days, it's obviously a couple of years ago you know in those days we didn't talk about that at school now my kids are at school I've got teenagers at secondary school it's a much more kind of open and supportive environment but in those days you know I remember one person did share with his friends that he thought he might be gay and it went all around the school and he was really taunted and mocked for this so it was a really horrific kind of response to him and so I wasn't about to kind of go in that that direction thank you very much school at that stage was not a safe place. Uh, when I went to uni, I was able to start being much more open about my sexuality, and that was a much more uh, safe environment. So I shared with people that I was gay, but I was already a Christian, and my ch the church that I was in kind of gave clear teaching. They were willing to teach about sex. They were, it wasn't something they hid or, or ignored, thankfully. And they said, they taught this, they said, sex is good, but it's for marriage, and therefore you should wait for marriage. That was the teaching. So a three, three point talk, as it were, or I'm summarizing it. Sex is good, but it's for marriage, and therefore you should wait for marriage. So it was a bit better than Augustine, at least, but there was a bit of a problem, or particularly for me, because I thought, well, I'm not going to get married. I'm not attracted to women. Of course, this was long before you know, equal marriage, same-sex marriage. And so I was like, well, that's not an option for me. So therefore, I think I'm going to have to remain single. And so I was open about this, both within my kind of uni, with my uni friends, and with my church friends. And it's interesting because you might think, gosh, if you kind of read the right kind of newspapers, I'm a Guardian reader. So, if, you know, if you're a Guardian reader like me, you would think, well, this poor, vulnerable young Christian, you know, he's going to be, you know, in the church. And often the church is portrayed as quite homophobic, isn't it? He's in the church. He's going to be kind of having this homophobic response to his sexuality. Um, but actually, for me, my experience was quite the opposite. In the church, I experienced a very supportive, uh, affirming, loving environment, whereas my kind of secular university friends um, were quite you know, challenging to me about the way I was living my life. Because they were like, well, we think it's weird enough that Christians don't have sex outside marriage, but you're saying you're not even going to have sex at all because you're just going to remain single. You know, you're crazy. What's wrong with you? And so, you know, some of them were like, pushing back like that. Others were much ruder, and I won't kind of repeat what, you know, what some of them sort of thought, really. So for me, the, the, my kind of, my, my normal friendships, my friendships with people who weren't Christians, that was a place of challenge, although I knew they cared about me, 
but the place of my, my place of safety was very much the church because they were kind of supporting me and loving me. They accepted me just as I was and encouraging me to live the way that I thought was the right way for, for me. Um, now, uh, the, I just want to kind of unpack a little lesson from this. It's not a kind of complicated lesson, but I'm sure you would love this church uh, and you'd love to be the kind of person that is um, a safe, welcoming place for LGBT people, for example. And so one of the top tips that I can give you is, well, I can give you two top tips. The first was, I talked about my school environment not being very encouraging, but in my family, actually, my family was a really good um, space for me uh, when I realized I was gay because my parents had always said to us, and I've got two brothers, and when we were growing up, they'd always said to us, if any of you are gay, that won't bother us. We will love you just as you are. We will accept you. So please, you know, don't feel any, any shame about it if that's, your, if that's your sexuality. And so my first little tip for you, if you're thinking I'd love to be a welcoming person and I'd love this to be a welcoming church, is um, be proactive in talking about it. Don't keep it a secret. Don't, you know, if you're somebody that wants to be welcoming, kind of find a way to express that to people. Like my, now, of course, when, you're, when your parents say, when you're a teenager and your parents say to you, you know, oh, we love you just as you are, we, you know, whatever your sexuality, you know, there'll be some parents of teenagers in the, in the room right now. You know, that's the kind of conversation you hate having with your parents at the time, isn't it? And I was like, shut up. Dad, you know, I don't want to hear about this right now. But of course, when I realized I was gay, I was really grateful that they had had that conversation um, with, with us. And likewise, in my church, there's this very kind of supportive environment where people, people would say to me, you know, well, the fact that, Sean, just that, you know, the fact that you're gay doesn't make any difference to us. We love you just as you are. We accept you just as you, as you are. In fact, I remember one guy who was quite old school. He spoke in quite a sort of uh, these kinds of tones. And he said to me, Sean, I affirm you. And do, do you know what? I, I felt affirmed. You know, like it worked, you know. It, it's not rocket science how we can help people feel welcomed and loved just as they are. And I think that's really important. So we love people unconditionally. Of course we do. Uh, whatever their sexuality, whatever their background. Uh, at the same time, though, in my church, like I said, they did teach things about sexuality. They did teach this teaching that sex is good, but it's for marriage. Therefore, you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. You should wait for, for marriage. And so here's the thing, because I think often in our culture, we are given the idea that when it comes to how we respond to, well, it might be LGBT people, but it might be all kinds of other groups of people as well, how we respond to people, we either have to love them and accept them, or we might tell them kind of what the Bible says and you know, kind of give, them a, give them a challenging message. And it's almost like we, we find it hard to believe that you can do both of those things. It's almost as if you're either going to be someone who loves and accepts LGBT people and other people, vulnerable people, or you're going to be someone that tells them like the, what you think is the Bible's teaching on it. Uh, you know, and you have to pick. Are you going to be like... And, and, then, and it, again, if we're given just two options, then it's like, well, I definitely don't want to be one of those nasty, rejecting, homophobic Christians or homophobic churches. Therefore, I'm going to be one of these loving ones and we, we treat it as if this you know it's an either or choice but for me as I've kind of tried to share my experience was very much in the church I had both of these responses at the same time I was loved and accepted for who I was and yet I was given kind of the challenge to say well what does Jesus say about sex how should we be living our lives in the light of Jesus's teaching so unconditional love and kind of challenging moral teaching, does that remind you of anyone? You know, like it's again, like we can think the, we have to choose one of these things. But Jesus, in the way that he lived, he somehow held together this amazing combination of grace and truth, of loving everybody. People were drawn to him, weren't they, from all kinds of different backgrounds, perhaps especially the people who were rejected by kind of the religious uh, people. They were drawn to Jesus, and yet he didn't mince his words and didn't kind of water down what he thought. So for me, it was this combination, this is the first point if you're following the hand, this combination of kind of being loved and accepted for who I was, and yet being challenged to live my life the way that, um, that I thought the Bible um, uh, uh, taught me to. And this is the second point, really, which is to say that amongst gay people, 
Therefore, there, there's a range of different views about how we should live our lives. Again, it can be quite easy to think if we just listen to kind of, you know, the, the kind of the dominant voices in our culture and the media and so on, that all LGBT people want, you know, believe the same thing about how they should live their lives and want to, the church to move in a, a direction that will kind of bless same-sex marriages, for example, and so on. And, you know, you know, like there are many people in that category, but then, but there were also people like me that I remained kind of persuaded by the church which is current teaching, namely that sex is for marriage, marriage is between a woman and a man. Um, why on earth did I continue to think that, you might ask? And I'll just give you a kind of quick comment on this. Um, you may want to open your Bible at Genesis 1 if you've got a Bible with you, or you may want to scroll to it on your phone if you prefer um, using, using the phone for, for, for that. Because um, for me, I was, I was studying theology, so I had a lot of free time. And so, I, uh, and so I went to the, the university library and I got all the books that I could about this topic. One of my kind of chaplains at university encouraged me. She said, go and check this out for yourself. You know, and again, that's a top tip I would share. You know, encourage people to think, read and think for themselves in this topic. And so for me, it was a case of, actually, I just don't think I can wiggle out of that this is what the Bible, what the Bible says. So in Genesis 1, if you look at verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, which I think is a reference to insects rather than like you, you creep. You know, I think it's, that's what it's going on about. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What is the most important thing about God? Nice, easy question for you, okay? Like, what do you think? It's just call out. There's no right or wrong answer. Well, there might be some really wrong answers, I guess. But like, you know, like, what do you think is the most important thing that Christians believe about God? Any guesses? Not allowed to answer, you two. <coughs> that he is love. Amen to that, okay? The Bible doesn't say God loves, although it does well, it does say lots of time that God loves, but it goes even further than that, doesn't it, to say God is love. That God's nature, not just his character, but his very nature is love. Why? Why, why is that? Why do you think that is? Any guesses on that one? That was the right answer, by the way. <laughs> But why is God love? We may bring the clergy into this one if we need to. Well, let's test that. Oh, that'd be fun. Let's see if they can tell us. Why is God love, Fran and Tim? <laughs> it's who he is. You're getting close, warmer. Any other thoughts about this? Think about who God is. Are we getting a bit close? That God is triune, okay? We had Trinity Sunday. A few, we had Trinity Sunday a few weeks ago. I don't know if you did a talk on, 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 on that at the time. You might have been doing something else. That's fine. But God, now you'll get a bit of Trinity now. Instead, God is triune. That God, at his most fundamental level, is not just one person. And that's why God is love. Even before he's created any humans to love, he loves within the love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? And so isn't it interesting that God said, let us, plur interesting little plural there, make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his, back to singular there, his own image. In the image of God, he created him, singular, male and female, he created them, so even in this early passage in Scripture, there's this interesting back and forth between is God singular, what, well, there's only one God, is God plural, but there are three persons, and this God who is relationship says, I want to make someone like me. 
I want to make a partner for me. I want to make someone who reflects what I am like. And so the way he makes us as humans to reflect what he is like is by making us male and female. Just as God cannot, God is not just a singular being. He is, he's kind of, he's tri-personal. He makes us not as singular being just as men or just as women. But when he makes, he wants to make someone like him, he makes us, you know, new, new, this will not be new information to you. He makes us different to one another. You've noticed, haven't you? Men and women are different to one another. And yet, and yet, men and women are the same as one another. We're all human. We all share one human nature, just as there's only one divine nature, and yet we're differentiated, as Fran was talking about earlier in the, in the service. We're different to one another. So our, our sexuality, the fact that we are sexual beings, is, 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 so good, is, is such a good thing about us. Not, you know, sorry, Augustine, but it's such a good thing about us because it reflects God. Our sexuality is not just biological, it is theological. It is saying something profound about the nature of God, uh, the fact that we are different to one another, and yet we are the same as one another. I won't go into the, I won't look at this verse, but we see the same thing in Genesis 2. There's two creation stories, slightly different to one another, in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2. And in Genesis 2, you get Adam, and the, it's the story of Adam and Eve. God creates Adam, and he says it's not, he's alone, he's on his own. It's not right that he should be on his own. And then he brings Eve, he brings Eve out of Adam's side, not because Eve is inferior, by the way, but because the point being, she's from the same flesh as he is. Uh, and so there, again, it's emphasizing their equality. And he brings Eve to Adam, and they have this moment of encounter. Oh, I'm, I think I will look at it now, because I'm, I'm pretty much looking at it, aren't I? They have this moment of encounter in verse 23 of chapter 2. The man says, at last, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of, of man. So again, it's the same. It's the both and of you're the same as I am. You're the same bone and the same flesh taken out of my side, one human nature. And yet I see in you someone who is different to me in a way that I quite like. You know, at last I can have this encounter. To, the encounter there relies on the fact that they are the same as one another and yet different. You're the same enough that I recognize myself in you, and yet you're different enough to me that, 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 that there's something exciting about it and something kind of um, uh, that, 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 that I can have an encounter with you. You're not just the same person. Uh, you, you should be called a woman because she was taken out of man. So our, our sexuality is this amazing thing that points away from from itself to this theological reality. That's in the kind of Genesis 1 and 2. And then there's another thing that sexuality mirrors, or particularly that marriage mirrors. We see it developing in the Old Testament um, where the relationship between God and his people is seen like a marriage. And we see it particularly in the New Testament. I really won't look at this one uh, in view of the time. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul speaks about how marriage is a sign or a symbol of the relationship between Christ and the church. So marriage mirrors the Trinity, but it also mirrors uh, the, uh, the, the relationship between Christ and the church, our union with Jesus. You, you are not Jesus, are you? Just, again, a little news, new information. My, my wife sometimes says to me, you know, she says, me is not short for Messiah. You know, we, we, we are not Jesus, but we are united with him. That's a wonderful gospel truth. Such a reassurance when we're feeling, you know, deflated and low, or when we're feeling ashamed of our sin, whatever, however we might be feeling. You know, to know, yeah, but, but that is not my ultimate reality. My ultimate reality is I am one with Jesus. 
I've been united with him. So again, the fact that I am one with him, even though I'm different to him, a different person to him, but truly united. Again, in the New Testament, we're told this is a symbol of the relationship between Christ and the church. Uh, or marriage is a symbol of that. You know, this, the, 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 these people who are different to one another and yet truly united. And that is, again, why sex is such a good thing. As it says in Genesis 2, going back to Genesis 2, um, and verse 24, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. S sex is created by God. It's a good thing. But this is why... I ended up believing that sex is, is for marriage. It's not just for any situation because it's, it's joining these two people who are different to one another into this union that reflects these amazing theological realities. Okay, let me just do a quick chime check. I probably should stop soon, but I've got just a couple of practical points if I might be, uh, if I might end on, on the flip, flip to page two. And as Fran mentioned, I'm really happy. I thought, you know, you, you can't just turn up and talk about sex for half an hour and go away again. You know, it's probably a good idea for those who would like a bit of a chance to ask questions and explore. That's why we thought it would be good to offer over coffee for those who want to, a bit of a, 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 bit of a chit chat um, uh, after the service. Um, you, you, or you can just come and listen to what other people ask if you don't feel comfortable asking a question, that's fine too. Top of page two. So I felt very welcomed in the church, but where I think the church did need to do better was in terms of being positive about singleness. Uh, all of the things that I've said are very positive about marriage, but we also need to be positive about singleness, uh, not least because, again, I won't ask you the trick question, because Jesus himself shows that marriage is not uh, necessary to living a fulfilled life or a godly life. And so for me, at, at the time that I was single, although I did feel supported in my sexuality, where I didn't feel so well supported by my church was as a single person, and especially as somebody who thought they were going to remain single on a long-term basis. So I won't go into more comment about that in view of time, but that's just something you might want to ask about, is how do we ensure our church is a, a supportive place for single people, as supportive as it can be. And then the second point I just want to say is, well, you might be thinking, well, how on earth did he end up married to a woman? Uh, is this like this weird set up? Or, like, are they in denial about, the re about things or whatever? And I think for me, the big change was that I had come to identify my sexuality as, as being gay but based on my feelings. But you, what, what we found in Genesis 1 and 2 is a much more physical definition of sexuality, much more related to our bodies. And so to cut a long story short, what, what I started to do was to say, to say to myself, I don't think I should be defining myself in this way. And over time, I def then experienced a level of change, not by any means a sort of a complete reorientation, uh, but a level of change in my feelings and ended up falling in love with, uh, with, with Gabby. And thankfully, she liked me too. Um, so, so that is kind of, that's cutting a very long story short. And again, you're very welcome to ask uh, uh, about, about that, about this question of, but it's this question of identity. Okay, well, that, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you very much for having me. Do you want me to say a little prayer now, or are you going to come up and lead us in prayer? Should we pray? Well, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you care about our sexuality, that you are at work in our sexualities. Whatever our own journey, we've all got our own journeys, our own backgrounds in this area. Everyone will be different, and you love and care for each and every one of us just as much. There's no moral high ground. There's no better or worse. We are all precious to you. Thank you for that, Lord. And we do pray that you would help us to be people who are welcoming and caring. Uh, we pray that this would be a church that is welcoming and supportive for everyone, for married people, for single people, for straight people, for LGBT people. Uh, Lord, help us to uh, share your love uh, and to know your love for us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.